All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. What day is it? This is the third day of August in the year of our Lord, 2024. It says there down at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Um, this is Friday, too, come to think of it. Or, no. This is Saturday. Yeah. Huh. Okay, uh, what I want to talk about today is not a new subject. Uh, it is something that's been haunting Christians <laughs> Well, since the New Testament, since Christ, um, we, the genuine born-again Christians, and if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. It's just a fact. Uh, you can call yourself a Christian. People can call you a Christian. You can do Christian things, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Only God can make you a Christian. It's a supernatural reality. Jesus said you must be born again or born from above, which is the more literal rendering of that. Uh, it is something God has to do. Uh, you have to have a relationship with God. You have to be a, a part of the new covenant where God does work in you. He has to renovate you. He puts a, There's a new creation that he brings into your innermost being. It is not your mind. It is not your soul. It is not your, uh, your body. It's your spirit. You get a new spirit. And a, a new heart that goes with that, uh, that, that is spiritual. This is a spiritual reality. It is more real than real, but it is invisible. And uh, we ourselves sometimes only recognize it slowly and vaguely and everything else. And it's confusing. It is very confusing to be a genuine Christian. Fake Christians aren't confused. They're of the world. Uh, they live in the world. But spiritual Christians, those who've been not something, your work, but God's work in you, we live in two worlds. We live in the kingdom of God and in the, 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 the kingdom of Satan. Our bodies live in this physical world that's under the dominion of Satan. And we ourselves... The true we, that which is born of Christ, lives in the kingdom of God. And we're, we're torn internally. Now, Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 6 and 7, I believe it is. 5, 6, and 7. And you look in there and, and you'll see that, that he's talking about himself. He says, I, I find myself doing those things I don't want to do. And the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. Why? Because we are still in the these natural bodies, which... Paul refers to as the flesh. He's not necessarily referring only to the physical skin and muscle and whatever. But we're born into this world as children of Adam, fallen human beings, sinners. But we must be born again, as Jesus said, in order to enter the kingdom of God. Because you can't go from dead in trespasses and sins to alive in Christ without God doing it. You need to be resurrected uh, spiritually before you're, you know, we, while we're in this world at this time, we live in these mortal bodies in which sin still dwells, yet in our, uh, in that new thing God has done us, in us, in our spirit, we are truly saints, that that which is born of God does not sin. It is this outward thing that we we're born naturally with is where sin dwells. And we're <clears throat> caught in this uh, confusion and dilemma uh, where we want to be with God and perfect and sinless. And uh, we want to be, uh, but that will happen when Christ returns with the redemption of our bodies. 
even when we when we leave, if we die, we leave the natural body behind, so we're 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 not subject to sin then. But we're not we're we're not fully uh, what we're supposed to be until we're resurrected, and that hasn't happened yet. That's what we're waiting for. It should happen soon. It's a blessed hope, and Jesus gave us signs, and they're happening all around us. I'm not talking about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. Those have always been with us. Uh, no, he said, but the end is not yet. But he talks about other signs, and one of those is uh, talks about the last days, the, the multiplying of lawlessness. And that's definitely what we see in this world uh, and in, this, in, this, uh, in the United States. Lawlessness. Not just uh, the, the criminals on the street corner, but the criminals in Washington, D.C., the president, the Congress, the, you know, the, the courts. They are of the world and children of disobedience. But the Bible, one of the things, the children of Adam, Paul refers to them as the children of disobedience in Ephesians. He says, that's where we all were. That's where we all started. And then we're born again, and we find ourselves one foot in uh, on earth and one foot in heaven. And we're torn. We, we can't understand ourselves, and we can't understand the world we live in, and we can't understand this thing called church. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you were born again during the Jesus Revolution, and that was a revolution. But a lot of those people weren't born again. But it's some, it's, you know it's something God did in you. You know that no matter what you, you're in your for imperfections in your mortal body today, you can say, yeah, there's still sin in me. But you look back and say, yeah, but I'm not what I once was. There's something God has added. There's a new creation in me. And we long to be free from sin and to be what God has destined us to become. Sons of God. Created in the image of Christ. Conformed to the very image of Christ himself. Which will happen when he returns. Until then, we live in difficult times. And they're getting more difficult. Um, but I want to explain this confusion that exists and uh, among Christians, and I've, I've been a Christian long enough <laughs> and experienced enough confusion that, that I think I'm a little bit, um, I might be able to understand. I've always been driven to understand things. And I can understand this, but it doesn't solve the problem. But, but maybe it'll help you to understand it too, because it is indeed confusing. And a, a new believer, you 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 think, well, now I'm perfect. Now I'm not going to have to be troubled by sin anymore. And, and that lasts a couple days. And then you gradually realize too the depths of of sin, and that you, you, you I mean, it it is everywhere, uh, in everything man does, everything the flesh does, and it's it's uh, it's like it's like being a child of Satan, chill a child of disobedience. That's how we're chill. We're like a, we're of his kingdom because we are, uh, we're born into the a fallen race that is a, that has been disconnected from God. That's the fundamental problem. When, when Adam sinned, God said, "The day you sin, you shall surely die," and he did. He spiritually died. He was cut off from God, and God is all that is life and goodness and truth and love and mercy. All that. Adam cut himself off from. He joined the other side. He joined the rebellion. Satan's rebellion. He believed Satan and chose to disobey God and cast all his descendants along with him into death. That's why there's death in the world. That's why there are, there's all these evils, that uh, natural disasters too, because man was to be God's presence in the world, his temples, his agents. Not limited by the power of our physical bodies, 
but acting in harmony with God. As Jesus said, if you have faith and doubt now, you can say to this mountain, be picked up and cast into the sea, and it will obey you. As Jesus said, as a man said to the, the storm, to the wind, and the waves, be still, and it was so. That's what human beings were created to be. In harmony with God, as his highest creation. God's dwelling in us, his presence in his own creation. Visibly. But then something happened. But God set out with a plan to solve that problem, and that plan is Jesus Christ. He himself came into this world to save sinners. He became a man, dwelt among us, died for our sins, and rose from the dead. Now, that broken relationship with God is restored by God in Christ, but it's God's work. As Jesus said in John chapter 3, you have to understand that. It is no, you cannot cause yourself to be born again. As Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again? Can he enter back into his mother's womb and be born? Well, it was a rhetorical question. It was a, Nicodemus, which was a, an intelligent man, a rabbi, one of the, the greater rabbis in Israel, and a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body, was asking Jesus, please clarify, I don't quite understand what you're saying. And uh, he was rebuked by Jesus. He said, you should have understood it. Why? Because it's in the prophets, especially in Jeremiah chapter 31 and Ezekiel chapter 36. The promises of a new covenant. God has to save us. We cannot save ourselves. Humanity tries, but they fail. Always. Because the dead cannot raise themselves. Okay, so... Uh, Let's do a little history quickly here. I'm going to try to be quick. We have this confusion in in the New Testament. We see this between the the physical, the natural, the fallen humanity, even even in ourselves, and that which is of God. Well, Jesus said that He will build His church. Remember that uh, upon this rock. What was the rock? The confession that Jesus is the Christ. It's Christ is the rock. He is the foundation. That's consistent throughout the New Testament. It's not Peter. Peter is not um, a stable enough rock, a big enough rock. Peter, the name Peter is a, means stone. It doesn't mean rock. It's not a Petra. It's a Petros. It's a difference. It's a difference. And the Roman Catholicism is built on the Petros rather than the Petra. And that's the problem with it. So let, let's go back in history. Roman Catholic. Uh, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism is not the oldest part of Christianity. No, it came it came along. Uh, it, the, it's based on the papacy. If you if you look, uh, you don't have to go to Rome to visit the Vatican, uh, St. Peter's Cathedral. You can simply do it online and actually get a better view. The the words uh, it, it, the uh, St. Peter's Basilica there, what we think of as the Vatican, but it's. Uh, it's the grand structure that replaced the, the church structure that Constantine had built. Uh, and, you know, it was finished in, well, it took hundreds of years, but it was like the, 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 the Middle Ages, 1400s, 1500s, uh, the, the popes were, it, it's built to the glor glory of the papacy. And it's it, uh, uh, overhead where you see the, 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 the huge, the high altar uh, built with the uh, bronze pillars that were originally Roman pagan uh, statues of horses, I believe, uh, by the uh, Renaissance artists. There's another thing, too. The Renaissance, that was all about man. Uh, everything that humans do is about man. But the, the papacy, it says... Uh, it quotes that from Christ, upon this rock I shall build my church. And it's about the papacy being the rock, the pope. That is a false church. It is a natural thing. It is a church that man built. So we have, which is really what I want to say here, there's two kinds of churches. There's a church that God builds, 
uh, which is uh, those who are supernaturally born again by God through faith in Jesus Christ. And God establishes a relationship with you, a personal living relationship, an intimate relationship. He dwells in you. You can't get more intimate than that. And you'll find all kinds of Protestants and Roman Catholics and everybody else on the Internet mocking that. That, that re Christianity is a relationship. They mock it because they don't have it. They don't know it. They don't understand it because it's never happened to them. They, they, they belong to a church that doesn't need God. Man can do it. The Pope doesn't need God. The, the Roman Catholic, uh, and let's, so let's go back in history to the origins of, of the of the papacy to the origins of Roman Catholicism and farther back to the imperial church to the eastern church which is older than the Roman church Roman Catholic church I'm not talking about a Christian community in Rome of course it didn't start there did it it started it in Jerusalem so let's go back in time Let's go back to the first century. To be a Christian, you had to be born again. Were there people that called themselves Christians that weren't? Yes, we find them in the New Testament. The New Testament has examples of people that believed. Simon the Magician, Simon Magus, is an example. He saw the works of the apostles and he believed and was baptized. He joined themselves to him. The baptism is, is joining the church. It is, it is uh, confessing Christ. But it wasn't God's work in him. God hadn't got him, brought him to, to true repentance uh, where, where he confronts you with your sinfulness. And he hadn't called out to God to save him from his sinfulness. He, he was not born again. God had not changed him. And that becomes evident. When he goes to Peter and tries to buy the gift of giving the Holy Spirit. Well, he's a professional religionist. He was like a prosperity teacher, you know, a magician, a sorcerer. Uh, he, he did fake miracles. Or natural miracles, you know. You see all these, uh, like Benny Hinn blowing people over. That That is... That is a natural thing. A stage hypnotist can do the same thing. It's not of God. God doesn't do stunts. God is not an entertainer. And America has been good for generating all kinds of false religions. There's a reason for that, too. But so we, we go back there, and there was always these problems. Simon, uh, the magician, he was not truly saved. And Peter, when he came to Peter, Peter recognized that the Holy Spirit revealed the truth that that uh, Simon's uh, Simon the magician's heart, not Simon Peter's heart, had not been changed. He was still in bondage to Satan, as all the children of Adam are. Bondage to sin. That's why he wanted to buy the gift of uh, dispensing the Holy Spirit, so he could sell it make a profit out of it. He would have been a great American. It's all about money. And Jesus said you cannot serve God and money. No man can serve two masters. And we live in a world that says you can. A world that's constantly filled with lies. Because there's no truth in it. Because there's no truth in Satan. Truth is only in God. So we see see the, the uh, false believers. Now Simon probably, Magus thought he probably thought he was a believer. He didn't recognize. He thought it was just natural. Say, oh, all I got to do is get baptized and say this confession that Jesus is Lord, and I'm a Christian, you know, like Donald Trump and most Christians. It's all about external things. That, it's things that man can do. If man can do it, it is not genuine Christianity. You can't go join the church. 
It's by invitation only. God has to do it. God has to call you. God brings you. You can't bring yourself. Because it's supernatural. It requires God. Any church that doesn't require God to function is not his church. His church is invisible because at the current time, he's invisible. When he comes again, then the church will be sane, visibly, with him, in glory. And that's got to come quickly. We know he has to return soon because he has to return soon. He said that uh, those days, those difficult days that we're beginning to experience now, will be cut short because if they weren't, no human beings, physical human beings would survive. So they will be sh cut short. Christ will return and put a stop to it. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. It is bad. So, but what, what happened was gradually over the early, in the early centuries, if you go back and read the, uh, the ancient church fathers and, uh, you know, the, 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 the Christians didn't stop writing with the Bible. And you find a, a whole collection of, of some. Uh, all of them have some rather odd ideas uh, to one degree or the other. And you see the rise of churchianity, what I call, well, others have called it churchianity too, where the focus changes from Christ to the church, to an institution, to an organization, to something you can see and touch. And that's natural, as for a, non, uh, a person that's not born again, that's all they can say. As Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot perceive the kingdom of God. You can't see it. You can't perceive it. Because you're not able to. You're a natural man. <clears throat> unregenerate. And as more and more unregenerate people uh, uh, join themselves to the Christians, or, or children that grew up that had never been born again, uh, you know, so you, you, it, it began to become more and more mixed with people that were not God's work. And they always gravitate to the natural because that's the only thing they can say. And you could see that in the writings of the so-called church fathers. The farther you get away from the New Testament, the, the more and more natural it becomes, focused on the visible, on the church that can be seen, on the assembly of believers and the organization. And you said the growth of the, the, the elders and deacons or bishops and deacons uh, were evolving into a special priesthood and a ruling class. And a becoming separate from the people, contrary to the teaching of Jesus. Call no man rabbi because you're all brother. Christ is your teacher. So it's a total contradiction of, to what Jesus Christ himself taught. But that's natural for natural people because that's all they can do. They cannot behold Christ. They don't have that relationship with him. They don't have that reality of a personal living relationship that God has created in them. That God has moved in to themselves. Well, if, yeah, it, it's like, it, it's amazing when it happens too. And you might not understand what happened to you, but you know something happened to you because your relationship with God is completely different. The relationship with you and God before was, I don't know him, and I don't want to get too close to him. You have fear of God, but not a love of God. You might have a love of the church. You might have a love of religion. You might have a love of philosophy or theology or whatever, but you don't know and love God. He has to put that love in you, real love, supernatural love, divine love. And when you're born again, you, 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 you might not have the words, you, might, you probably don't have the knowledge of the Bible to say, well, that's what Jesus said would happen. This is, what the, this is all speaking of in the New Testament. 
Yeah, you, you read the, the New Testament before, perhaps, and you listened to the preachers preach, and you thought that was Christianity. No, that's not Christianity. You have to know Christ to have Christianity and to be able to understand it, to see it. And people that haven't been born again can't understand it. It's like, you're weird. You're different. You're not like me. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. In some ways, in some ways, we still live in this mortal body with with sin so that dwells in it. So, yeah, we are like you in some ways, too. We have that continuation. We're not angels come down from heaven. But God, is, we're redeemed sinners. But we had this gradual intermixing of... Uh, with the world on regenerate Christians and the church, and it was taken it the wrong way, and the church was getting weaker and weaker and weaker because it's becoming less and less spiritual. And uh, it was also subject to persecution, which tended to keep it from going too far in the wrong direction. So Satan was trying to de destroy it through persecution. And uh, the human natural man, uh, as, as uh, Paul talks about this too, that the that which was born according to the flesh persecuted the one that was born according to the promise in the Old Testament. You have have uh, uh, Ishmael persecuting uh, Isaac, for example. And that was, uh, uh, he uses that as a, a, an example of what happens to us today because uh, we are of God, and they are of the world, and they we're weird to them and strange to them, not part of them fully, and uh, they're afraid of us too, because they're afraid of God, because they're sinners, and they love sin. God would take their fun away. Not fun either. But so it was going downhill, and, and then we have the right, you know, and Satan couldn't stomp it out. He could corrupt it, he could pollute it, but he couldn't stomp it out. And then uh, you have Constantine comes along. Uh, the Roman Empire is a mess. So you have three rulers at the time of Constantine, uh, and one of them was, was Constantine. And uh, they had published an edict of toleration, which basically ended the overt state persecution of Christians. So if we can't beat them, let's join them. And Constantine, I believe, he was looking at Christianity, this new thing that was triumphing over paganism. Paganism, there was all kinds of different pagan religions. Rome had no core, no glue to hold the empire together. Just power. That's all it had. Like America today. It has no core. Never had a core. And America is the new Rome. When the, with the fall of the Soviet Union, and we were saying, "Yeah, the America is the new Rome." There were there were people out there. The philosopher out there was talking about the end of history. What he meant was, America won. It will always be there. America will be uh, the center of all things. Bye bye, it's gone. What was that song? Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Yeah. Yeah, the end of the empire. Empires never last too long. The American Empire is dying right now. Babylon the Great. The American Empire and its West. And the West is, well, being replaced. It's hated. Empires are always hated because they're predatory. Uh, beasts. They're they're vampires. They enrich themselves by enslaving others and and taking their resources. That's what empires always do, including the American Empire. But back to Constantine. But it's just America's really like the New Rome, as everybody was saying at once upon a time, in the late 90s and early 20s, uh, early part of the century, first century here, the 20th, 20th, 21st century. 
But constant, there was no unity, and Rome was was. Uh, I mean, if you look back back in the history, it was not this nice orderly procession of of emperors. After the Republic, the Senate couldn't rule. They were they were dysfunctional. They were self centered. They were uh, they didn't want to take responsibility for anything. Just like the Senate and Congress today, so they kept giving the the uh, uh, the council more and more power. Uh, Julius Caesar. So he was like the executive, but the Senate was a real power. And so they were they were giving, they had another body that was like the House of Representatives. Does it sound like America was modeled after Rome? Yes, it was, the Roman Republic. And But because of the Congress, they, uh, they wanted the perks, but they didn't want the responsibility. So they would just unload all these decisions to the council, which was Caesar, the family of Caesar, Julius Caesar. And eventually they decided, well, I think we've given him too much power. And now uh, I think we had to eliminate him. So you had uh, the famous et tu Brutus, you tu Brutus. So the, uh, the Senate conspired together that they would murder Caesar and all of them would take a part in it and all of them would stab him. Uh, and the reason for that is nobody could claim that they were innocent and everybody else did it. Because they all had a hand on, in it, and they were all guilty, so they were all partners in the crime, so therefore nobody would be tempted to try to bail out. And that's what they did, and of course uh, it didn't work out well, and then along came Ti Tiberius, who was, uh, especially during the time of Christ, and he was, well, it got worse and worse and worse, and uh, Biden has always reminded me of uh, Tiberius during his final time on Capri, an island in the Mediterranean off by himself, indulging his sexual depravity and his he was a angry, crazy old man that was dangerous to be around. And he didn't want, didn't want the responsibilities of rule anyway, so he gave it off to, to his uh, cabinet, put it in American terms, to re the responsibility. And they were tyrants. And he wasn't really interested in what they were doing anyway. But if you went to Capri, your life was in danger. And that goes on to other emperors that came after him that were even more twisted, and they were twisted by Tiberius. But it was a it was a mess. The Roman Empire was a mess. They had no common values. They had all these people. It was not uh, so. You had all these different nations, and they were all part of this imperial system. And there was no. Uh, so you had an overarching, uh, to put it in American terms, federal government with all these states. And the power is generally in the federal government. It's not supposed to be that way, but that's the way it was and is. And so it was, everybody benefited in some ways. There was a certain Pax Romana, Romana Roman peace. Uh, the Romans wouldn't permit the, their their client states to fight with with each other. They were basic. They were semi autonomous, usually, unless they were troublesome. And then a, uh, then a uh, a governor was sent in, like Pilate, to govern the troublesome area of Palestine, of Judea. Judea was always a problem. So they brought in Pilate uh, to govern. But that wasn't the normal situation. Most areas had their, like Galilee, had Herod the king. But he was a vassal of Rome. He was not the head. He was just a local person. And he, had, he was responsible to maintain peace or Rome would replace him. Herod owed his kingdom to Rome anyway. Uh, but... So the, the Rome was unstable. There were revolutions. There were revolts. There were conspiracies. 
emperors were murdered. Uh, the army would set up a different empire, emperor. You had competing emperors engaged in civil war. It was just it. And it was too big. So that's why at times you had, at uh, the time of uh, beginning of, uh, of uh, Constantine, you had actually three Caesars or three emperors, co-emperors. And then they gradually got whittled down to two. And then Constantine gradually whittled that down to one. And that's the kind of thing it was. But Constantine recognized this is unstable. This is a mess. How can we? How can I glue this thing together? And Christianity was coming up, and Christianity had a core set of values, and it was uh, uh, made a whole lot more sense, and it was simpler than this pagan stuff, and everybody had these different religions. So he said, well, maybe I can use this. I think that Constantine was not a genuine Christian. There is no evidence that Constantine was a genuine, biblical, born-again Christian. So, But he decided he was going to, like Donald Trump, uh, favor the church. So he, he put his imperial favor on it, and they said uh, they made it legit, a, a legit, le a lawful religion. The word legit is where we get that word. Legitimate, it was, in other words, legal. Yeah, cr cr uh, Christianity was recognized as a, uh, a legitimate, uh, recognized religion uh, with imperial favor on it, and and then he called the uh, uh, assembly at Nicaea to resolve a dispute within the Christian community between a theological dispute between the Arians, which were the heretics, and the Orthodox about the deity of Christ. Arians were uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are Arians, uh, followers of Arius. They did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. They believed that he was uh, the first creation of God, and God created other things, everything else through him. You can find some Bible verses for that, but you have to look at the totality of what Scripture teaches. And, uh, and no, the, the, that's not what the Bible teaches. Just because you could spin something a certain way or understand it falsely a certain way because of your ignorance of the rest of Scripture does not make it so. Just because you can find a verse doesn't prove anything. It has to be consistent with everything else. So, but the, the Arians, uh, uh, Constantine wanted that issue resolved because he wanted to use Christianity for the empire as, as glue. Well, if you've got two different, if the glue doesn't stick to itself, you've got a problem. So he wanted it solved. He didn't care who won. He was actually more inclined to the Arians. Uh, the Jehovah's Witness branch. <laughs> Jesus, the creature. Well, a creature can't save you. Let me put that point that out. But it was it was sort of in line with uh, Gnosticism, uh, a, a sub deity, a lesser god, as an emanation of the the thing, <laughs> the one, the oneness. And you know the uh, the Gnostics. They could spin their beliefs to make it look like Christian and use the Bible for their own purposes, too. And it all feeds in together. But, but Constantine uh, called the Council of Nicaea to, to uh, end the dispute. Uh, the, that acceptance by the church was terrible. He called for the bishops to come. Less than half showed up. A lot of them said, what is the emperor to do with the church? But again, by this time, the church had already, in the mind of many Christians, become uh, the center. Rather than Christ, it was a relationship with the church that was important. It's obvious reading the ancient writings. That's not Christianity. If you're in Christ, you are in his church, which is invisible. You have a relationship with your brothers and sisters who are also in him, and he is in them. He is the glue of the real church. See, if, if, if there's a, a born-again believer, I mean, we'll always get along because Christ is in me and Christ is in she or him, him or her, and he is what makes us one. It's not the color of our skin. 
It's not our language. It's nothing like that. Our unity is Christ himself. Not an organization. But human beings can't create genuine Christians. And if you want a state religion, it has to be able to accommodate everybody. It has to be something man can do. And state Christianity, a state church, will never be the church of Jesus Christ because it is something man can make, man can build, just like St. Peter's Basilica, man built it to the glory of man. It's obvious. To the glory of man. Not to the glory of Christ. To the glory of man. To glory, the glory of the papacy. Because the papacy claims to be the rock. Claims Peter's... Peter, you know, they claim to be with the throne of Peter. Well, Peter is not the rock of the church. Christ is. If you go back into the second century writings and look in Irenaeus and, and all the other er, very early writings, none of them say Peter is the foundation of the church. It's Christ. So we probably can't see it, but just imagine when Jesus was saying that, he maybe was gesturing to himself because Peter confessed him. This is the rock upon which I will build my church. Church is built on Christ. Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead. That is consistent with the teaching of the scripture. So your interpretation of a passage has to fit with everything else. But in order to have a state church, it has to be a natural church, not a supernatural church. And it already had moved in that direction. And with Constantine, it, it became a, legi uh, a legitimate religion, the favored religion. Uh, Constantine began to pay the salary of the clergy. Hey, guess what? The guy that pays your salary is your boss. If, it, if, if you don't get, if Christ isn't, say, so already he bought the priesthood, which is illegitimate anyway because it had become very sacramental. See, and sacraments are things people can do. Human beings can baptize. Human beings can hold up a piece of bread and say, this is my body. It's obvious you got all these manifestly unregenerate priests that are just wicked. I'm not saying all priests are that wicked. Okay, It's, it's obvious. There's the revelations that have come out over the last 50 years, for example. Uh, in Rome, uh, the, 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 the stories told by some archbishops like Vigano that, that Francis has given the boot to uh, about what some of the things are going on there in Rome. Just, just, just manifest wickedness. Homosexual orgies and everything else, attended by bishops and cardinals and, and covered up by the police. Because it's, you know, when you have a state religion and the, it's a part of the state and important to the state, the foundation of the authority of the state, you have to have a, a divine foundation. America had no foundation. So, uh, you, you, it you, it has to be something that man can control and man can man, can man, maintain. See, man doesn't like God because we can't control him. Try to, but can't. See, God doesn't. God is not at our command. But Constantine wanted to, and. Many people that call themselves Christians, they were all about church anyway by that time. Because they didn't know Christ. And church be, Christianity became a, a part of your relationship with the state and the government rather than a relationship with God. 
And it didn't become fully established uh, in Constantine's reign, but I think the second, the, the, not the next, uh, there was a Julian the Apostate went back to paganism, and then along came the next emperor, I believe, and then uh, about 390 or there, about the time of Augustine, uh, Roman Catholic, or Catholicism, Christianity, became the official and only legal, legitimate, legit religion in the Roman Empire. That was it. Because, and, and to, to disagree with the official virgin of that, of the, which came about at Nicaea, so you had a official creed. There are no creeds in the New Testament. You had the so-called Nicene Creed, and if you don't conform to that, it no, no, doesn't matter about how... I'm not disagreeing with the Nicene Creed as far as what it says, really. But the idea you could create a religious statement that was the binding authority and that you had to conform to that was illegitimate. Because it's not revealed by God. The Nicene Creed is not perfect. And they kept writing more and more creeds. So it was a, a way to get rid of the Arians, to suppress the Arians. It was written in such a way to rule them out, to separate them. And then they were persecuted by Constantine. Either conform or go into exile. It wasn't about arguing and debating what the Scripture says. They simply created a political document to cast the Aryans out. And they had a majority. The Nicene Confession is not godly. Its purpose was to get rid of the Aryans in order to satisfy the desire of Constantine for unity, for his empire and for his using Christianity as glue and a foundation for authority rather than simple power. And it worked fairly well for that purpose. But it also led to the continual persecution of genuine Christians. Because genuine Christians say, you must be born again. Uh, the state can't make you a Christian. Baptism, sacraments don't make you Christians. You cannot make yourself a Christian. God has to make you one. The priests have no power to do anything. They can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. But they created these institutions, and then the power of the state was behind the institutions, and they amplified the institutions, and that's where you get Roman Catholicism as a final result in the West. But before that, you had the, the, the East is really just plain old imperial Christianity. And that's where that comes from. And Protestantism is a continuation. It was just going back to imperial Christianity. Because of the magisterial reformation, it's often called. It was, the, 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 instead of the Pope, it was just getting rid of the Pope and the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy and substituting the king as the head of the church. See, it was going back to uh, Constantine's purpose of Christianity as a servant of the state and a foundation for the legitimacy of the state. And so if you disagreed with that version, that official version of watered-down, man-made version of Christianity, because it has to be watered-down, because it's not built by God. It has to be something man can do to serve that role. Like America as a Christian nation. Not. Never was. It's an anti-Christian nation. It was a rejection of the Constantinian 
uh, union of church and state. And again, but that structure was not completed by Constantine, but he began it. The polit and the political use of the church. You see that all the way through history. The disestablishment of Christianity uh, didn't really begin until in the Europe until uh, the 20th century. And it's still the established faith in in the UK. Does Christianity have any real connection with the UK with uh, Britain? I mean, is that anything to do with real Christianity? No, nope. no. Nope. It's a homosexual embracing nonsense because it's not real Christianity. Uh, Pope Francis, what does he have to do with Jesus Christ? Not a thing. Not a blessed thing. Nothing. He's a usurper. He's man. He represents the church that man built. The church that Constantine began, and literally, the Vatican, the uh, and the the Basilica of Saint Peter there was the original building was built by Constantine, and then it was renovated by the popes and transformed into what we see there today. So you talk about the church that Constantine built, quite literally so. And the, the great dome uh, uh, of, what is it, uh, Holy Wisdom over in uh, uh, Constantinople, which is now called Instant, Instant, uh, Instant, why can't I say it this morning? The big city that was Constantinople and the, on the Bosphorus. Inst, 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 Istanbul. I'm not saying it right for some reason. Okay. Uh, that, which was the largest church in Christianity, Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople on the Bosphorus and built. That was the center of Christianity. Rome was out in the boonies. That's why he moved the capital. Too far west. It was in the pagan sort of area. So he wanted the center of commercial activity. So he moved it there. And built the, the biggest thing around and wanted to build a Christian city that was not connected with all the, the pagan history for his new Christian empire. But it wasn't real Christianity because it was created by man, not by God. Just like Nicaea was the work of man, not God. And all the other creeds and confessions. And they replaced the scripture. Not that the scripture did continue to be read, but it just became part of the liturgy. Christians became the work of man and the church that man built rather than the church that Jesus Christ built. And that continues today. That's why you have this confusion in the United States. Oh, this is a Christian nation. Well, in the sense that the majority of people in the United States identify themselves as Christians if asked, are you Muslim? No. Are you an atheist? No. Are you a Christian? I guess so. That's it. You ask him, do you have a, does Christ dwell in you? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you know him? Do you know that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you? That's a biblical test. It's not biblical Christianity. It's man-made Christianity. I think in the 1890s or thereabouts, uh, late part of the 19th century, there was a Supreme Court case, and the Supreme Court ruled, and Christians love to use this, or so-called Christians, uh, America is a Christian nation. Well, they looked at American history, and they said, well, yeah, it had some influence. Of course, uh, uh, John Adams... Uh, one of the quotes is not often quoted is said this the Constitution is by no means built upon the Christian religion 
See, the founding fathers were not Christians, not real Christians. They were not even, not even uh, uh, man-made Christians. They were deists. They didn't have genuine Christianity at all. Not even the phony man-made kind. But Europe, from the time of Constantine onward, you had this growing Christian empire that was Christian in name. It was it had the some trappings of Christianity, but only those things that human beings can do. Can human beings baptize someone? Yes, you can sprinkle them or immerse them in water. But that doesn't make you a Christian. You can claim to have power. You can have, claim to be have the, have the power to forgive sins. But that doesn't mean you have it. As long as people will accept it, and when the power of the state backs up that version of Christianity, Christianity, quote, unquote, the, the, the church that man built, well, those that don't agree with that are in trouble often. And that's, that's a confusion that persists. Protestantism, except for the, uh, the Radical Reformation, which was a mix of all kinds of different groups, Protestantism was returned to the Constantinian synthesis of church and state. So rather than the Pope, because the Pope had just got too big for his own britches, rather than the Pope uh, uh, being the head of the church, instead of Christ, the king became the head of the church instead of Christ. Because it wasn't Christ's church anyway. So you had this, uh, this uh, character, Henry VIII, uh, that de decides to become Protestant for his own personal reasons and reasons of his kingdom and others. Uh, and you had uh, Luther put the church in the pocket of the king of the emperor, the, uh, the the ruling, the princes, whatever it happened to be, and uh, Lutheranism has always been very subservient to the state. Demonstrated that in World War II. Uh, you have uh, Calvinism, which is maybe one of the more independent varieties, where Calvin uh, tried to put the state and the church next to each other, mutually supporting, in a marriage, bound to each other, but not uh, the state was the princes were not over the church the 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 pastors were supposed to be over the church so uh, which was where he was so that was uh, the church was uh, not any more of a spiritual god wrought creation under Calvin than it was than anything else other than in the theology or everything is caused by God so but that's uh, so the Anglicanism Lutheranism. Presbyterianism, it was all, uh, in one sense or another, the, the continuation of Constantinianism, going back from Rome to Constantine, which suited the princes and the kings just fine, allowed them to confiscate church property. And Oh, yeah, that was a big part of the conversion of some places to Protestantism. Uh, the Scandinavia, when they converted to Protestantism there, it was uh, the, the kings and princes would look at things, hmm, all these monasteries, all this church property that the church has accumulated over the centuries, it will all be mine <laughs> if I become a Protestant. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, who knows what all the motives were, but there's all those, mo those motives are always in the background uh, because there's still, even among born-again Christians, sin still persists in our mortal bodies. So we have this, we're, born again Christians, we, we live, not only we're divided internally between the flesh and the spirit, but we're also of the kingdom of God living in the wrong world. We're living in the kingdom of Satan physically, but we're part of the kingdom of God. And you wonder why we have a confused life. And with, when we don't understand that, when our mind gets filled by media, which are constantly bombarding us now, Satan's, you think, 
you know, the, the modern communications era for many, what it is, what we have today with the entertainment, this is the entertainment of Satan. It's designed to keep us, our minds occupied with everything but Jesus Christ. You ever notice what's not present uh, in the corporate world? Christ. So it's all about, it's, you know, they are the children of disobedience, and they run this world at this current time. The children of Satan. Who controls Google? Satan. Who controls Microsoft? Satan. Who controls Facebook? Satan. And the actual bosses of these things are never born-again Christians. Because Satan puts his people in power. When it comes to election, Satan is the one who puts forth candidates. You can vote for these guys. They all belong to me. I don't really care which one you vote for. I'll give you a choice. That's democracy, satanic style. You can vote for whoever. It's, it's, this is how it works in the Soviet Union, too. They, they, they did have elections in the Soviet Union. But they were all of the same party. In this world today, in the United States, we have the same thing. They are all of the same party. They are all of the party of Satan. They are all of the party of Adam. None of them represent Jesus Christ. None of them are willing to say publicly in front of everybody, Jesus Christ is Lord and I will obey him. He supersedes any human authority. Would you be elected? No. Could you take the oath of office? No. That's why Christians shouldn't join the military or any oath-bound thing. Because you can only, you're, you have given your allegiance. Now, see, this is another thing about a born-again Christian. That's not true about those that are man-made Christians. Made by your parents or by your community or by your church or whatever. By birth, physical birth. <sighs> Your allegiance is to Christ. If push comes to shove, you go with him. If that if he is this is the earliest church confession was Jesus is Lord. That's the only biblical confession. Why? Because he is your king. He is your savior. He is your God. Not these clowns that we have in Washington or anywhere else. Certainly not that those fat old perverts they have in Rome. We don't confess them as Lord, only Christ. And the world hates us because we're not part of it, even though we live in it. And we, we need to understand this and not be so confused and wonder why things are the way they are. We will not be comfortable until we're with Christ, until he comes back. There will be no more elections. And Donald Trump is not Jesus Christ. Just point that out. But personally, why, why do we have these conflicts? Why do we find ourselves... We're, we're being pulled by the world constantly, more so than ever, with, uh, with modern technology. Constantly filled with antichrist propaganda, because it is antichrist. Capitalism is viciously antichrist. Uh, socialism is the glorification of the state. All these, these things of the world are an, are enemies. The world is an enemy of Jesus Christ. The systems made by human beings uh, under the lordship of Satan. It's all contrary to Christ. To one degree or another. It's not good because it's not of God. They don't do not confess the Lord, Christ as Lord. Especially start, starting with the American Revolution, it was the throwing off of established Christianity. 
the founding fathers rejected the Constantinian synthesis. They rejected Christianity. At all forms of Christianity. So you have the the state natural the the, the church that man made, they rejected that, and the church that God made, they rejected that even more. They just embraced Satan. They embraced the world. They embraced enlightenment theology, philosophy, which did not come from God at all. It was a glorification of man, the idolatry of man, the worship of man. And that was clearly demonstrated, manifestly so, in the French Revolution in the Reign of Terror. which we're entering into again. The age of lawlessness on a global scale this time. Not just France, but globally. The exaltation of man is satanic. And we're surrounded with it constantly. Just go to the universities and see if you can find a Christian professor. Even, even Christian schools are barely different than the world. Christian churches, even ones that claim you need to be born again, they tend to be very much like the world. And they, 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 are, they do not seek to live differently. Some, you know, because they're probably thoroughly mixed too. Evangelicals and the fundamentalists are getting, well, now, you know, people that are called evangelicals today are people like Joel Osteen, who is a complete anti Christian. He did not, you know, if, if it's not about Christ and Him crucified, it is not Christianity in any sense of the word. If it's about your prosperity, it's not Christianity. But it appeals to sinful people, doesn't it? Which is why he has the biggest church in the United States. Because he appeals, he's a carnal, unregenerate man, and carnal, unregenerate people listen to him because he tells them what they want to hear. That's how you make a following. You tell people what they want to hear, not what they don't want to hear. So if you are a born-again Christian and you're struggling and confused and wonder even about yourself, why do I do the things I do? Why do I do those things I, I hate? And fail to do those things I love in Christ because your body hasn't been redeemed yet and sin still dwells in you and if you're a deceived person like a member of a holiness church I just want you to know the reason you're struggling is not because you're a failure it's because the theology you've been taught is not true it's not biblical it was created by man, by John Wesley. And you've been deceived. You wonder, what? well, I'm supposed to be perfect. I'm supposed to be sinless. The Bible doesn't say that. We haven't been glorified yet. You were deceived, as were those that were before you. So it's not, God has left us in this state until Christ returns. Or until we leave this earth. Either way, the state we go to is far better than this one. That's why Christians don't get too upset about at funerals. At the funeral of a, of a, of a, uh, a saint, a, a believer, person that's born again it's a celebration they've gone home
They've gone to rest. We don't have rest in this world. Christ is only in Christ is a rest. And only when we're, you know, if we, when we're occupied with the things of this world, it's like, oh. It's like this is this is a burden. All this emptiness that surrounds us constantly. All this noise all this foolishness, all this evil. But Christ will return. And he will take up the throne visibly and rule visibly. And his people will rule with him in righteousness and truth. But not yet. Not until he comes back. You can't have the kingdom of God on earth manifestly so ruling over the earth without the king present